Thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jose Tapia Granados. Jose is professor in the Department of Politics at Drexel University. Uh, he has an interesting career. He combines public health with economics, uh, even though now he's really, really 100% an economist. No? Uh, he received his degree in medicine from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. He practiced for a while. He then received a master's in public health from John Hopkins University and a PhD in economics from the New School for Social Research. Um, his main research areas include population and economic change, climate change and economy, climate change and population dynamics, crisis and population, and all areas connected to issues of development, public health, and, and economics. His publications have appeared in prestigious journals, including the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Demography, European Journal of Population, Social Science and Medicine, among many others. Recently, he has focused his studies on the mortality changes in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, with particular emphasis on the connection with specific crises, including the Chernobyl disaster. He has recently published a book on the topic, and here is the book for those interested in, in crisis and, and mortality. And it's a pleasure to have him here today to present the results of his studies. Please help me welcome Jose Tapia Granados. Um, thank you very much. I want to, to start uh, uh, recognizing uh, Emilio Parrado and the Population Studies Center for giving me the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Uh, the presentation is basically the presentation of the book. This is a book that was published uh, in October. Uh, so it's not a very big book. It's 130 pages, but uh, despite that, I am not going to be able to, to refer to everything there. So I will refer to the major uh, points in the book, which are basically these three. First, the Chernobyl disaster. Second, the mortality crisis in Eastern Europe and the former USSR. And third, the potential causal connections between the two. So let me start with the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, you probably have mm, heard the term Chernobyl disaster and the Chernobyl accident. Uh, the two are used and depending the, the term you hear, you probably know what is going to be coming after that. But anyway, so uh, this uh, occurred in April 1986 in Chernobyl, which is located, sorry, uh, is located um, in Ukraine, uh, North Ukraine, about 100 miles north of the capital of Kiev, of uh, Ukraine, um, Kiev, very close to the border with Belarus and not very far from Russia. Of, of course, at this at the time, all these were parts of the Soviet Union. These were three republics of the uh, Soviet Union, the same as the Baltics, which are there and so on and so forth. So, uh, okay, so on, on April, uh, what was the date? I believe 25, uh, 1986, uh, one of the reactors in the nuclear power, power plant there uh, had a major explosion. And this happened when uh, some tests were being performed there. Apparently, there were major problems of, uh, uh, of uh, mismanagement. But anyway, there was this ex explosion. Uh, then two more explosions occurred a few hours later. Uh, the, the nature of the explosions is unclear. Uh, it doesn't seem it was only kind of uh, high pressure explosions because accumulation of vapor or something it seems there was a component of nuclear uh, reaction but anyway the fact is that these explosions uh, basically destroyed the reactor and sent several tons of very high radioactive material into the atmosphere and immediately uh, the, the 
graphite in the reactor started to burn and that contributed to more uh, emission of radiation to the atmosphere. Uh, first, the, because of the prevailing winds, the contamination, the, the radioactivity uh, uh, in, uh, embodied in all these uh, radioactive materials went to the northwest. Then uh, a few hours later, the wind changed and went to the northeast. And then uh, in the next days, changed again and went to the south. Uh, Southeast. So this is the, the the plume that that moved to the northwest. Uh, then basically went all around Europe, uh, covering uh, the British Islands, and finally moving north toward Norway and so on. Uh, so uh, this is this is a map of the United Nations Scientific Committee for. Uh, energy atomic uh, scientific committee what is the year energy uh, united nations scientific committee on uh, I, I forgot the <laughs> anyway it's about uh, it's a scientific committee on on atomic energy so this uh, this committee published this uh, map uh, depicting the estimated uh, Contamination because one uh, of the um, of the radioactive materials that was uh, liberated that is cesium uh, one hundred thirty seven. Uh, there were also uh, other radioactive materials emitted, including radioactive gases, strontium, plutonium, iodine, and other radioisotopes. But apparently, uh, cesium is quite important and well this uh, this map uh, shows uh, that uh, the darker spaces that are those with the highest uh, deposition of fallout of cesium 137 are precisely located around Chernobyl Chernobyl is over here and these are the areas more contaminated though you see there are some parts of Europe quite far for instance in Scotland or in North uh, Sweden, where there were major estimated deposition of radioactivity. So you see also here that in some parts of Europe, there are no data. That's Bulgaria and some republics of the old Yugoslavia. Uh, so uh, the question, uh, in a few days uh, after the, the accident, after this explosion, uh, radioactivity at, at normal levels was registered in places as far as China and North America. So the question is not what parts of the earth were contaminated, but uh, where the contamination was higher. Basically, this, uh, this disseminated worldwide. Okay, so I already said that, that was happening. The initial reaction of the Soviet government was to try to cover up the problem. Uh, so how the problem was discovered? Well, some uh, workers in, in a nuclear plant in Sweden noticed high levels of radioactivity and they started to investigate if there was a problem in, in the central and there was no problem in the central. So they started to uh, consider possibilities and concluded that probably the radioactivity was coming from uh, some part, and perhaps the Soviet Union, the uh, Swedish government intervened and started to talk with the Soviet uh, government. And finally, the Soviet government had no uh, way to uh, reject the, the, the existence of the, of the accident. Okay, so immediately because of the explosion, two workers of the nuclear plant died. Indeed, uh, I believe their, their corpses were never found. Probably they were vaporized or something like that. But then in the immediate uh, days after the accident, uh, all other 28 men, they were all men, no women. Uh, another 28 men died. Most of them were fire workers that tried to, to uh, fight uh, the fire that was occurring in the nuclear reactor and 
And when doing that, they uh, were exposed to very, very high levels of radiation and they got uh, acute radiation syndromes. You know, you stop producing uh, blood cells and in a few days you, you are dying because of that. Well, you, you have no defense for any mild uh, virus or bacteria, whatever. So, um, interestingly, uh, in the effort to try to reduce the liberation of uh, radioactive material from the open reactor, uh, one of the first things that was done was to try to put a lead on the reactor. Why? Well, you know, lead is very powerful to uh, as a shield for radiation. You, you know, you go to the dentist and they put you something on you that has a lot of lead so that when they take uh, an X-ray uh, of your teeth, that radiation doesn't go to your neck or your uh, heart or whatever. And that is because this coat is covered with lead. Well, they pour 2,400 tons of lead on the nuclear reactor. And apparently this was a total uh, a stupid uh, thing because uh, the temperature of the reactor was uh, hundreds of degrees and as soon as the lead was poured there it vaporized and the problem is that the lead is a very toxic uh, element so what were the consequences of that well it is unclear so um, during the spring and the summer of uh, the year uh, Close to a quarter million people were evacuated from the areas uh, more contaminated, areas in Belarus, Ukraine, and some parts of Russia. They were put in, in, in buses and sent to other places. Uh, of course, this created a lot of, of problems, but well, the Soviet government at the time considered uh, that was necessary to uh, avoid these people receiving a lot of radiation. And close to a million young men. Uh, there were very few women in this group, so-called liquidators. These were mostly soldiers of the Soviet army who were involved in the cleanup activities. So these people started pouring sand on the nuclear reactor with helicopters. They cut uh, hundreds or even thousands of trees that were totally covered by radioactive material and bur uh, uh, burned these trees on, under, under sand in trenches. Uh, they took care of uh, facilitate the evacuation. Uh, they made a, a kind of tunnel be below the uh, central to avoid some problems. Anyway, this people were probably subjected to major irradiation, okay? And, uh, well, I already mentioned that. So, uh, besides uh, the, the fact that the, it's clear that the radioactivity disseminated worldwide, but of course, uh, there is clear evidence, and in this there is quite uh, general agreement that uh, the Western republics of the Soviet Union were the most affected. What are the Western republics of the Soviet Union? Well, basically, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, so-called European Russia, so Russia, and the uh, Baltic states, uh, Estonia, uh, Latvia, and Lithuania. Okay, so what were the evaluations of this accident? Well, first, there was a lot of concern. Uh, people uh, uh, in the uh, agencies of the United Nations dealing with uh, this kind of issues were kind of prudent to say anything. But for instance, uh, there were some people like John Goffman. John Goffman is a, is a professor of the University of California, a molecular biologist and, and physician who was part of the Manhattan Project and has worked a lot on, on effects of the atomic uh, radiation. And he, uh, considering the, the, the accident and the, the news about the quantity of radioactive material liberated, he estimated that, uh, that close to half a million uh, cancer deaths would occur in the following years. 
and at least as many non-fatal cases uh, because of uh, because of the radioactivity liberated by the disaster. Now, 15 years after the accident, uh, this thing called the Chernobyl Forum was uh, was formed. This uh, was formed by eight agencies of the United Nations, uh, including the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Scientific Committee on Atomic Energy of the United Nations, and on CER, the World Health Organization, the uh, Organization of the United Nations for Food and Agriculture, so on and so forth, the World Bank, and the governments of Russia, Belarus, and uh, Ukraine. Now there was no longer a Soviet government. The Soviet uh, Union had disappeared in 1991, so five years after Chernobyl. Well, uh, the, this Chernobyl Forum uh, produced a report that uh, at the time was presented as a general conclusion on how bad had been the problem of, of the Chernobyl uh, accident and well recognized the direct consequences of the accident with 30 deaths and tens of thousands of evacuations and then estimated that a few thousand cancer deaths uh, would occur in the following decades in all the territories affected so basically they said that because uh, this it, it was a very small number in comparison with the millions of natural deaths. Uh, there would be no detectable demographic effect. And uh, at the time, there has been a, a quite high number of uh, reports of high morbidity and mortality in the areas around Chernobyl. And basically, they said that, well, considering the levels of radiation, that the people there had suffered well this was not consistent with all these reports of morbidity and mortality therefore they coined this term radiophobia so people were just obsessed because of the problems with the accident and this was causing all this mortality and morbidity so this uh report was interpreted by quite a number of independent observers as a kind of uh uh attempt to uh to say that this was not really a big deal and well a few people will die because of that of, of this uh, disaster in the following decades but that's it we have to come back to normality and so on and so forth so some uh, scientists uh, uh of the former soviet union for instance uh, nesterenko vasily nesterenko and another I don't know why is this there. How can I get rid of that? Uh, anyway, so uh, so these were Russians and, and Belarusian uh, scientists uh, that produce a, a long report on the Chernobyl accident and its consequences in terms of contamination and health. Uh, these uh, scientists uh, reported that almost 400 million people had been residing in territories uh, that had received over four kilobecquerel per square meter of uh, contamination between april and july 1986 and these are very high levels of contamination uh, they uh, said that there was no reasonable explanation for the fact that the international atomic energy agency and the world health organization were addressing the concerns uh, on the chernobyl accident in russia belarus and ukraine but they have forgotten about the rest of the world that had received uh, more than 50 percent of the radioactivity coming out from chernobyl and they uh, estimated that by 2009 already several hundred thousand deaths had occurred as consequence of the disaster in the territories affected by the uh, fallout and the new number would continue growing in the following uh, uh, decades so controversies on chernobyl have continued to the present and i will try to refer to some of them in this presentation so this is the present situation uh, of pripyat pripyat was a small uh, town close to the nuclear power plant in which 
mostly the workers of the plant we are living. And well, now this has been abandoned now for, uh, for what, 86, well, more than 30 years. You see all these uh, trees growing around. And it's very interesting that in one of the buildings there, they had put this thing on the top. And what I, I saw this photograph and I asked a friend whose wife is Russian, if uh, he or she could help me with that. And apparently this is Ukrainian, not Russian, but apparently Russian are more or less able to understand the Ukrainian writing. And they told me that this means, uh, this says, let's make the atom a soldier of peace, which is a kind of a very illustrative slogan of the uh, peaceful use of atomic energy in, in Soviet uh, in Soviet style. Okay. Okay. Let me talk now about the mortality crisis. So, um, what do I mean with the mortality crisis in Eastern Europe and the uh, Soviet Union? Uh, well, it was a very clear departure of trends in mortality in these areas. This crisis started. Uh, while well before the Chernobyl accident in the 1970s and extended until the 1990s and even much more in some countries. So for instance, this researcher, uh, an economist in the University of Florence, a uh, frequent collaborator with the United Nations, in a paper in 2016 estimated that this mortality crisis experienced in the countries that had uh, communist governments before 1990 uh, caused 10 million excess deaths between 1990 and 2000. Now, consider that this is only part of the crisis. The crisis had started before and in many countries continued after that. So this gives you an idea of, of uh, how important is this crisis. Uh, I don't know the uh, most recent estimates of the COVID pandemic total uh, mortality burden, but uh, must be what, seven millions or eight millions, something like that. Anyway, so let me refer a little bit to the historical context of the mortality crisis, which was also the context of the Chernobyl accident. So, you know, in 1985, the Soviet Union was in a situation, kind of uh, a strong progress in some areas and a strong problems in other areas. Uh, there has been a number of leaders, very old leaders, for, for uh, three decades after uh, Stalin had died. And finally, a young person was elected. Uh, it was a young member of the Communist Party of the Central Committee, Mikhail Gorbachev, and he became the leader of the Soviet Union when elected secretary of the Central Committee of the party. Immediately, um, three policies were launched uh, by Gorbachev and, the, and his team that were glasnost, perestroika, and an anti-alcoholism uh, campaign. Glasnost means, means transparency. Uh, it means that uh, from that time on, uh, people could talk about the problems in the Soviet Union without fear to be put in jail. Uh, perestroika, that is restructuration, means that many things uh, uh, started to be modified to try to uh, do things in a more efficient way. And well, there was a general acknowledgement that alcoholism was a major problem in the Soviet Union. So this anti-alcoholism campaign was launched. Now, in 1986, uh, in April 26, the explosion in Chernobyl occurred. Uh, two years later, in 1988, the anti-alcoholism campaign was terminated. Apparently, it was a very unpopular campaign and the Soviet government decided to stop it, though some researchers say that very likely the effects of the campaign extended until 1991. Now, in 1989, uh, the Soviet army retired, uh, draw, withdraw from Afghanistan. You know, they have been fighting in Afghanistan a very long and 
and very uh, damaging uh, war for the Soviet Union. But this, the uh, Soviet uh, government decided uh, to, re to withdraw all the troops there. At the same time, uh, uh, there were many problems for the communist parties in power in the countries of Eastern Europe. Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, so on and so forth. And in uh, that year, 1989, uh, the people of the Eastern Germany started to demolish the uh, Berlin Wall. And basically, at the end of the, of the year, the two Germanys were uh, unified. Uh, at the time, the Soviet government uh, didn't oppose these movements uh, in other parts of Eastern Europe communist parties were put out of power. The Soviet government did nothing to avoid that. And in all these countries, uh, a very quick movement, uh, a transition to the market economy started. Now, in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, Gorbachev uh, was still in power until the summer of 1991, when there was a coup d'etat against him the conservatives of the uh, Soviet uh, of the Communist Party tried to eliminate him and the Russian president Boris Yeltsin led the opposition to the cup but immediately at law the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Now a few months later in 1991 the presidents of Russia uh, Yeltsin, the president of Ukraine and Belarus uh, signed the Belaseva uh, Treaty, which stated that the USSR was finished. So uh, basically, Gorbachev uh, had no uh, means or didn't want to try to, to uh, face that, and he resigned as president of the USSR, and basically the USSR disappeared. That was December 1991. Under uh, Boris Yeltsin, the Russian economy is, was very quickly transformed into uh, a market system of free enterprise. You probably have heard all these stories about the oligarchs uh, becoming very rich by appropriating uh, enterprises that were before um, public enterprises and so on. Of course, this occurred in Russia, but also in the other uh, 14 republics of the Soviet Union, as well as it had occurred a few, uh, a couple of years before uh, in the countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, sudden transition from the centrally planned economy of the Soviet system to the market economy was very traumatic and very stressful for the people of these populations. So, uh, they are, for instance, estimates that in the early 1990s, uh, more than 50% of the Russian population was at levels of poverty. So let me show here uh, the, some examples of uh, mortality crisis uh, as illustrated by uh, drops in life expectancy at birth. Here we have data from the Netherlands, Spain, uh, Russia and the US, uh, you notice here uh, the effect of the world flu pandemic in 1918. What is this? This is the Spanish Civil War. This is the occupation of the Netherlands by the Germans. And what is this? This is the start of the mortality crisis in Russia. You see, this is the mid 1960s. And basically, Russia is at the same level of life expectancy than the United States and Spain. And well, I don't know, this, this, this thing here is very bothering, but if you notice here, the, uh, there is a major gap. And of course, this is uh, the mortality uh, crisis in Russia. Here, we see focusing in life expectancy uh, at birth for males, the the mortality crisis in the Western republics of the Soviet Union. So uh, you notice uh, that, interestingly, this line 1986 is Chernobyl. And, well, 
there is a surprising coincidence there with a major drop in life expectancy in all these uh, countries. Um, these are the other republics of the Soviet Union, uh, the republics in Central Asia and the Caucasus. They are much further away from Chernobyl. And you don't notice any major change in the trend of life expectancy in 1986. You see, um, you see the trends are more or less flat before and after that, they, there are no major changes. There are two prominent things here, one here in Armenia, that was an earthquake. And also there is a major drop here in Tajikistan that was uh, a civil war. But basically, uh, these major changes that are noticeable here, you don't notice here in the other republics of the Soviet Union that are much farther away from, uh, from the Chernobyl. Okay, so how important is the mortality crisis in each country? Well, uh, to estimate that, uh, we can look at the depth of the crisis from the point of maximum highest uh, life expectancy before the crisis to the lowest level. And we can look at the length of the crisis from the time uh, that life expectancy reached a peak before the crisis to the time that uh, that level is recovered after that, okay? So considering these parameters, these are the 15 republics of the Soviet Union ordered by the length of the, uh, of the crisis. And notice that the four republics with the longest uh, crisis are Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and Lithuania, with a length of the crisis of 29, 28, 26, and 25 years. This is the depth. Now, looking at the depth of the uh, mortality crisis, uh, we see that the uh, biggest loss was that of Tajikistan, followed by Russia, Latvia, Estonia, so on and so forth. Uh, but as already mentioned in Tajikistan, the, there was a civil war. So uh, excluding Tajikistan with, uh, because of this uh, war, uh, the seven republics of the USSR with the deepest and longest mortality crisis and related to war include the six Western Soviet republics. Okay. So, summarizing, there is a stark difference in trends in life expectancy at birth after 1986 between the Western republics of the Soviet Union, more contaminated by the Chernobyl fallout, and the other republics of the USSR. And this, in my view, is clearly suggestive of an effect of the Chernobyl fallout on mortality. Now, the fact that the seven republics of the Soviet Union with the deepest and the longest mortality crisis unrelated to war include the six republics of the USSR in Western uh, USSR seems in my view, also suggested that uh, the Chernobyl uh, fallout because of the accident may have had an effect on mortality. Now, there are other demographic uh, uh, trends that suggest radiobiological effects of the Chernobyl fallout. And uh, basically, these are uh, birth rates, uh, sex odds, and a stillbirth proportion. So let me go uh, first with uh, birth rates. These are birth rates in three of the Western republics of the USSR, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia. Well, there is again here a major change in trend before and after Chernobyl. The trends are basically stagnant or slightly increasing in the 10 years before Chernobyl, and suddenly they start dropping. Uh, these are the other three Western republics of the United, of the Soviet Union, uh, the Baltic states. Again, a major change in trend in the birth rate. So, 
Uh, these are the trends in birth rates in the republics of the Soviet Union that Yes. Uh, and there was a uh, population uh, movement in the Soviet Union that was a right? They didn't move people because of uh, Chernobyl. Right? In the, no, the evacuations basically were in Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and Russia. So these are the This is the evolution of birth rates in the other republics of the Soviet Union, the republics of Central Asia and the Caucasus. Again, no major change in trend. So uh, uh, this is uh, the case of Belarus, uh, showing very clearly the, uh, the change in trend at the time of uh, Chernobyl. And uh, this is a quotation of one of the uh, scientists of Russia who has uh, elaborated on these things, who says that spontaneous abortions as a rule are not registered so a change in that rate can only be determined indirectly from a reduction in the birth rate okay more uh, demographic evidence these are trends in sex odds so the the sex odds are the number of uh, of uh, males divided by the number of females at birth okay so that that birth odds is usually around 1.05, 1.06, meaning that as a rule, about five or 6% more males than females are born. This is a kind of worldwide rule. Now, they, this, this uh, odds has trends, varies uh, with time. And this uh, is based in 393 million births in the United States and Europe. And well, uh, at the time of Chernobyl, there is a quite clear break in the trend in Europe that is interpreted by Scherf and Boyd, these are German uh, epidemiologists, as indicative of the effect of the Chernobyl fallout on, uh, on the population of Europe. Uh, there is uh, knowledge from other studies that uh, irradiated males tend to uh, produce a, a little bit more uh, male fetuses than female fetuses. So this would be consistent with that. That uh, effect would last for a few years and then start to recover. Um, this is the effect in three countries uh, and the effect is the strongest the closer is the country to Chernobyl. So here you see the effect in Russia with a major jump in the sex odds, the effect in Germany with a quite a smaller jump, and the effect in France where there is basically no observable effect. And this is a trends in stillbirth proportions. Uh, in Western Europe, Western, uh, sorry, in Western Europe, uh, here, the top line, in Central Europe, the bottom line, and Eastern Europe. While the trend in Western Europe and Central Europe is basically linear, in Eastern uh, Europe, there is a quite apparent break precisely in 1986. And this is also based in, in very large data sets of millions of, uh, of uh, births. So basically, uh, summarizing what I said, mortality rates rise and led, uh, life expectancy at birth falls in the Western republics of the Soviet Union, which are the most affected by the fallout of the Chernobyl disaster after 1986. Birth rates dropped after 1986 in the Western Republics of the Soviet Union, which are the most affected by the Chernobyl fallout. The sex odds increase in Europe after 1986, but continue its declining trend in the uh, United States. Uh, in European countries, the greater the radioactive fallout, the bigger the increase in the sex odds. 
stillbirth proportions after Chernobyl increased for two years in Eastern Europe, but continued a declining trend in Central and Western uh, Europe. All these facts uh, are consistent with known effects of ionizing radiation. Now, what are the usual explanations of the mortality crisis? Well, uh, uh, since the crisis started uh, in the time of the Soviet Union, in the Soviet era, well, explanations often refer to the uh, living conditions there. And for instance, it has been pointed out that nutrition was quite bad, not because of lack of food, because of quality of food. So it had been pointed out that there was high consumption of saturated fat and a scarcity of fresh products. It has been pointed out a high consumption of tobacco and alcohol, like factors increasing mortality, and also a large degree of sedentarism in the population. The population of the Soviet bloc countries was not actively involved in physical, in physical exercise. Uh, now, for excess mortality after uh, the disappearance of the Soviet Union and the Soviet a system in Eastern Europe and the transition to a market economy after 1990, other explanations are, are given. So like the generalized poverty that uh, because of the economic disruption in the period of transition, uh, the psychosocial stress caused uh, by the disappearance uh, of, the, of the Soviet Union. For many Soviet citizens, it was a major blow. They feel citizens of a major country that had disappeared. Uh, indeed, uh, high levels of homicide and, and suicide after the transition are interpreted by many authors as, as reflecting the psychosocial stress of, of that period. And then uh, the end of the anti-alcohol campaign has been interpreted as a major cause for increasing mortality because uh, with the end of the Soviet system, restrictions for imports were, were suppressed and the uh, countries of Eastern Europe and the old USSR were flooded by uh, alcohol and liquor coming from uh, other European countries. So all these uh, factors uh, are very likely uh, having an effect on increasing mortality in these countries. But for instance, the psychosocial effects connected with the disappearance of the USSR uh, cannot start before that occurred, and that was in 1992. Uh, on the other hand, the effects of the cessation of the anti-alcoholism campaign and the increased consumption of alcohol could not occur before 1992 or at least before 1989. So none of these former factors seems a likely explanation of the fact that uh, uh, mortality start rising in the Western Soviet republics in 1987, that is following the Chernobyl disaster. Now, in recent decades, there has been uh, further uh, there has been uh, studies uh, revealing further evidence of the biological effects of radiation. For instance, uh, with a longer follow-up of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, uh, it has been uh, now clear that the effect in increasing uh, rates of cancer was not only for particular uh, types of cancer and leukemia, but more general. And increasingly, there is an agreement that the studies uh, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki are probably very biased because the studies were started in 1950, when uh, a lot of information had been lost, and indeed, a lot of survivors of the atomic bomb have already died. Now, studies of groups exposed to ionizing radiation, like industrial workers, miners of uh, uranium held workers, and the so-called liquidators have revealed that the effects of radiation are not uh, only on the incidence and mortality because of cancer, but also on the incidence and mortality of other causes of death, including uh, cardiovascular disease. 
Um, now, studies of the effect of the radioactive fallout from atomic bomb tests, uh, which you know were occur at a level of several hundred uh, tests uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s, have been seen to have a clear uh, effect on mortality. Keith Meyers is an economist, uh, is an American economist in a university in Denmark. He has estimated that close to half a million uh, extra deaths were caused in the United States between the 1950s and the 1980s by the atmospheric test of nuclear weapons in Nevada. Um, well, as I have shown here, studies of birth rates, sex ratios, and, and stillbirth rates in populations exposed to ionizing radiation strongly suggest biological effects of ionizing radiations. Indeed, over time, international agencies like the WHO and CERN and, and the International Agency, Atomic Energy Agency, have accepted higher estimates of the effects of the Chernobyl fallout on particular causes of death, like cancer. For instance, uh, the epidemic of uh, thyroid cancer in, the, in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia uh, in the early stages uh, of the Chernobyl Forum was considered unrelated to the Chernobyl accident and now is everybody accept that because the incidence of uh, thyroid cancer in these countries is uh, about 200 times that before the accident of Chernobyl. So all of this in my view is consistent with the Chernobyl disaster having uh, a contributing role to the increased mortality after 1986 in the nations of the former USSR uh, and Eastern Europe, particularly those of the Western Republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, how important is that contribution? I don't know. I don't know if it is 3%, 10%, or 53%, but I believe there is a lot of evidence that suggests it is not 0% as, uh, as suggested by a number of uh, a number of uh, uh, agencies and governments. And well, these are the basic ideas of the book, which are four. One is that the mortality crisis in the Soviet bloc countries is uh, the major health crisis in peace time in recent decades. Uh, a variety of causes had been suggested as explanation of that crisis, but the Chernobyl disaster has never been being connected with it, but there is uh, considerable demographic evidence suggesting that there can be a connection, particularly uh, for mortality in Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and the Baltic republics, also Bulgaria, that I find not mentioned, but anyway. So given the importance of this mortality crisis as a public health disaster and the scientific interest of defining its potential causes, this issue must be an open field for investigation and not a closed chapter, as has been intended by a number of governments and international agencies. That's all. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Yes. Hi, I'm really interested in the fertility impacts as well. And uh, I'm interested in what exactly is the explanation. Is it like being unhealthy that like leads to lower fertility ability of the women, or are there are there any further evidence of sort of like more on the stillbirths and, and other forms of? Uh, is there also like a behavioral explanation to like face into disasters? I I have not found any any explanation of the extreme drop in birth rates in the Western Republics of the Soviet Union after 1986. I have, I have looked at a quite uh, extensive uh, number of publications of the crisis and never have found any explanation. So I, I know that there is some research on natural disasters and how fertility actually bounces back, like even above the, the levels before. So like almost like as in like recuperation of the population after like a so it is like very much the opposite. So it's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So your your arguments rest on the idea that you know you're more proximate to Chernobyl. There's these bigger effects on fertility and mortality. 
she presented this interesting map, atmospheric map, where the, the radioactive material spread over Europe. It took a spin around Ireland for a bit there, and then it kind of came back. It kind of reminded me of like when volcanoes blow up in Iceland. Uh, do you have any evidence that it followed a trail like that? If you expand your geography a little bit, is there higher mortality along the ridge of that spread, or is it just too high in atmosphere? No. Well, they are. I mean, uh, in the in the days following Chernobyl, there were uh, levels of radioactivity measured in different parts of the world. Many countries measure radioactivity from time to time in a number of locations, and there is a quite good idea of how this blew evolved through uh, through Europe. And indeed, there are studies, for instance, of of uh, cancer incidents in Sweden in the uh, comparing the parts that had received more and less radioactivity and i talk about that in the in the book it's interesting because the same authors concluded that there was a clear effect on on cancer rates in sweden and then one year later they said well we have uh, made further studies and this is not clear i emailed them and they told me we are confused we are still researching this <laughs> so there are many things yet that are uh, being studied. So, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I guess I was wondering uh, if you have looked at Cooper level disaggregation of the super complex, the calorie uh, particularly. Specifically, you said that military men were sending enjoys uh, uh, to, to engage in clean activities. So I was wondering if the young adult spiders time were specifically affected by travel, the ways that may. I, 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 uh, I have looked a little bit, uh, for instance, I look at uh, infant mortality rates, and in general, uh, there is not any clear uh, evidence of a connection with the timing of the Chernobyl accident. In general, the, the, the uh, mortality crisis in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe there is agreement that affected adults much more than than children. Uh, how is this connected with the fact of uh, Chernobyl? Well, I am not saying that Chernobyl explains uh, the whole crisis. Many things are not uh, are not to be explained by Chernobyl. So um, that is what I, I can tell you. So yes. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. <clears throat> Couple of comments. I wonder if you looked at uh, causes of death data, which is widely available. Because, I mean, those theories, that, those common theories that you mentioned, um, they're based on looking at causes of death data, and they do point out the really major importance of alcohol as explaining these fluctuations. And that starts from the 1985 1986 jump. I know you start from 86, but there is a big jump between 85 and 86, which is uh, directly explained by the start of the and the implications thereafter. And so, those of that data would be really helpful, I think, to further support your explanation. The other comment is about the Central Asian, Asian, uh, Central Asian Republics. Yes, they are further away from Chernobyl, but they are also very different populations. Um, and in particular, they are mostly Muslim. Populations where alcohol consumption is not as prevalent, and in fact, of course, if you disaggregate by Muslims and non-Muslims in these republics, the, the Russian uh, ethnics living in these republics have had mortality trends that are exactly the same as the ones that you see in Russia, even though they were very far away from Chernobyl. So I think the Central Asia story also looking at this post that data and perhaps is looking at by I think it could be yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the, the, the importance of alcohol in the mortality crisis, I believe, is undeniable. They are, they are, is, the evidence is massive. Now, for instance, it seems quite clear that the campaign, there is a quite general agreement that the anti-alcohol campaign, despite being very unpopular, was very effective, reducing mortality rates. And you see the, clear, clearly the life expectancy was shooting up from, from the, the time that the campaign was started. But then the campaign lasted uh, mostly until the end of the 1980s. And then uh, death rates started to decline exactly after uh, 
1986. So there is some inconsistencies there, and I don't believe the uh, alcohol uh, is a good explanation for this sudden transition on uh, mortality rates. Now, let me say something that I uh, is like shooting against me, but anyway, science is like that. Uh, if if uh, Chernobyl is going to explain that sudden change in trend in life expectancy just in 1986, that means a massive effect, right? So that doesn't fit with my idea that other factors are playing a role too. That's correct. That, that is something that I am not able to, to explain. I don't have a good explanation for that. And I believe it, this is a major field of research. I have, uh, I have read many articles and books on this, and nobody is considering that there are a number of factors playing here, and, and the, the explanations must uh, answer questions about different things. So, anyway. Now, yeah. just to add to you know another variable that the age pattern of mortality that I don't know, you know, thinking about the sudden change or whether this is a long longer term, you know, it could be that you know alcohol consumption uh, affects certain ages differently. You what what expectations would you have about the age pattern of mortality, whether it comes from alcohol consumption or from from Chernobyl? That that could also be interesting. Yeah. Yes. And similarly, also looking at gender differences, because your data is all for male, right? Yeah. Um, and men in Russia drink, right? It's a men issue with alcoholism. Yeah, in the book, I have an, an appendix that is titled Gender Issues. And there I defend my decision to do uh, most of the analysis with, uh, with the life expectancy for males. And I include there some graphs for life expectancy for females that basically rebel similar trends, but less pronounced. And I give some ideas of why I believe the uh, effects of the Chernobyl fallout could be more intense for males than for females. What is this? Well, first, there was about 1 million males, the, liquid, the liquidator that suffer massive irradiation. Second, well, the idea is that the, uh, the radioactive materials that uh, were thrown to the atmosphere by the explosions and the fire, then little by little deposited on the ground. And for instance, uh, on grass that was eaten by, by animals, but, uh, what is clear is that if you are outdoors, you tend to receive more radiation of this radioactive material that has been deposited than if you are indoors. And in general, if this is a gender issue, uh, men tend to be outdoor more than women. I believe that is quite, uh, quite uh, uh, consensual. So, uh, considering these things, uh, I believe that there can be a general idea that the, uh, the, the fallout, the radioactive fallout from Chernobyl could affect, have an effect on males more than on females. On the, and on the issue of uh, biological sensitivity to radiation, I look at a number of publications and apparently there is not any clear indication that there, there is a differential sensitivity of males and females. So that's what I can say. Okay, we run out of time. Thank you very much.